We're going to get started with uh, Senator Chambers and Rick Clark. To, uh, y'all come on up and uh, open up the first session. The idea here was to kind of lay a background as to and show that there was other um, things going on, what was going on in the community, how people who weren't directly involved in the uh, Panthers and that were impacted by the activities of uh, law enforcement and others at that time. So it's uh, Ricky Clark and uh, Senator Attorney Chambers. Uh, this mic. Uh, good morning. Okay. Um, I want to thank the um, community, neighbors, and friends for coming out. Uh, my name is Vicki Clark. I am the, I'm one of the older sisters of Mary Alice Clark. Um, Mary Alice um, has been missing since 1972. She was 14 years old when she pretty much vanished. Um, for many, many years, we thought that, um, well, my family thought possibly that um, this was maybe a homicide, you know, um, local. Um, maybe she, you know, wandered off or was taken away from uh, the area somewhere else. We really didn't know. But when she first um, came up missing, my mom went to the Omaha police. Um, they didn't take a report. They said that she was a runaway. Uh, there was no evidence of um, foul play or homicide, so it was kind of like, you know, oh well. So for many years following um, uh, Mary Alice's uh, disappearance, um, we just kind of thought that maybe it was a homicide. Maybe eventually, you know, a body would turn up. Maybe um, we'd get some information. We lived, you know, kind of like numb for many, many years. Um, in the process of all of this, it devastated my mother, who is now still alive at 94 years old. Um, she's succumbed to Alzheimer's disease, but believe it or not, um, she still talks about Mary Alice. You know, sometimes it's 3 o'clock in the morning and I can hear her uh, talking about this child that um, she never got any closure on. But um, we lived, you know, um, just kind of thinking that, you know, this was some type of crime that had been committed, which <laughs> it was a crime. In my opinion, it's, it's a crime, but a crime that was never, like, really put on record. Um, but in, 19, in 1996, um, I believe it was around 1996, um, I got a visit um, in my building. I worked for OPS for 16 years. I got a visit in my building from a, uh, a lady named um, Christian Zeichel. And it was at that time that my eyes became open to something totally different as far as what could have happened to my sister. Um, Kristen told me at that time that she was here to, um, that she had been working for many, many years um, in trying to free um, Mondo and Ed Poindexter and that she was going to be taping a kaleidoscope um, session with Ben Gray that coming, week, that coming weekend. So it was at that time that Kristen shared with me um, an ATF, a copy of an ATF warrant that my sister had been named in. And so at that time, that was the turning point of believing that this was not just a homicide or a disappearance of a person, that there were people, you know, uh, involved in this that knew something. And it's, it, what they know, we still don't know. We've, we've never um, been told anything, but this ATF warrant, um, someone had tried to black her name out, but you could clearly see through this pen that did not um, black, you know, out the uh, the name that she had been named in that warrant. Uh, prior to my sister disappearing, to our knowledge, um, nobody had ever said that they saw her at that Black Panther headquarters, which was right around the corner, maybe a block from where we lived. Um, you know, we knew all the neighbors in the neighborhood well. Um, Mary Alice had lived there from the time she was three years old, so she wasn't a stranger, you know, to that area. So it was just real strange that um, 
she would be named in an ATF warrant, and number one, my, my mother wouldn't have been notified because at that time my, my dad had been deceased since 1967. But uh, my mother was never notified that she was named in an ATF warrant. Like I said, we, ne we were never told. And at that time, you know, neighbors really looked out for neighbors. You know, um, if you were seen somewhere on your way home from school or in the neighborhood that another adult felt that you had no business and it was told to your parents. But that never happened. So um, following, you know, this information from, um, from Kristen, um, she urged me to get involved and she was willing to help me. There were other people, I think at that time there was a lady um, by the name of Marge Marlette, or, okay, Donna Lincoln, she was willing to get involved and help. And I took all this information, I thought it over, and to be very honest, I became frightened. I became scared of the unknown. Um, I had children at that time that were small and my fear was if my sister can just disappear and nobody has any information, nobody knows where she is, at least this is what, you know, nobody's doing anything to find, um, you know, a child, what could possibly happen, you know? And my mom was, you know, well, she was older at that time, she's, well, aged, and I just didn't feel that um, because of the unknown and my fear of what, you know what I mean, the police and other people uh, that had to have been involved in this, you know, um, could bring down on me, you know, as a single parent and having small children. So out of the fear of the unknown, I, I, I backed away. <coughs> okay, um, I was afraid to try to even get involved to um, find out what happened, you know, to my own sister. But my family has lived for many, many years um, wondering um, if she's still alive, um, if she's still alive, where is she? Uh, could she have been put in a witness protection program? There's just a lot of unanswered questions. And it had really taken the mind of my mother away many, many years before she um, was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease in 2002. If the phone rang uh, and nobody said anything, she thought it might be Mary Alice trying to make contact. If it was around the holidays, um, it just tore to pieces, you know, that. And I mean, she, she lived in such um, a world of paranoia, you know, thinking that uh, anything strange, unusual, different could be something connected to Mary Alice. And it, it really drove her, it drove her crazy pretty much. And it was very difficult all these years to live and watch her, you know, her life be taken away, you know, like that. And, and watching that, um, I prayed, you know, that I could just get through this and, and, and hope that, you know, before, you know, I leave this earth that maybe there would be some kind of way or something would change where we could find out something. But just watching her, it's like, I, I just don't want that to happen to me. You know, I mean, um, I know that there's a little bit of difference when there's a mother you know what I mean, and then a sister, but then there's not a lot. You know, um, you lay, you wake, you wonder, you know what I mean, where is this person? Um, then I'd say um, maybe 2002, 2003, um, I found out that somebody had gotten a birth certificate. There was a birth certificate obtained uh, for Mary Alice, I think in 1996. Um, I, I couldn't get any information from vital statistics uh, if you don't have proper reason to uh, acquire a death certificate or a birth certificate. You just can't get that information. But because my mother, seven years following the disappearance of this child, uh, was paid the life insurance benefits, um, after the insurance company told her for 10 months they searched for, for Mary Alice, um, it was paid based upon, I found out, a declaration of death and not an actual death certificate because there was never any uh, proof found that she was dead. So it makes me wonder, who got that birth certificate? There was never a birth certificate obtained for Mary Alice, um, except for after she, you know, I think my dad, uh, I found out that my dad got a birth certificate when she was like maybe two, three years old. But after that, 
there was never uh, there was never another copy or anything obtained until around 1996, which I didn't find this out until like maybe 2000, um, 2002, 2003, I found out that somebody had, had obtained one. So how do you answer that? I just don't believe that um, Mary Alice would have stayed away from her family from the time she was 14 years old until now if there wasn't a reason for this happening, if she's alive. And of course, if she's not alive, then, you know, that would, that would answer it. But um, now that my children are grown, um, I have different feelings about, um, you know, trying to find out some information. Tarek has been um, somebody that has kept in touch with my family and, um, you know, um, asked if we've heard anything and have let us know that he was willing to, um, you know, guide us in any way that he could, you know, to see if we could get any type of information. And, and I've made up my mind now that I'm ready to go forward and try to do that. Like I said, all my kids are grown. Um, I don't have that fear of, you know, if something were to happen to me, be behind something like that, that I would be leaving behind small children for somebody else to raise. So, um, I would like to know before I leave this earth, um, what happened to my sister? And like I said, you know, after seeing that ATF warrant, it makes me really believe that there were people involved that really know what happened to her. So that's kind of like my story. Um, I thank everybody for listening. Thank you. Could we ask a question? Sure. Um, after the police initially refused to take the report, did you go back again after several months or a year and say she's still gone? And My mother never gave, gave up. I didn't, but she never gave up. And uh, after I um, received the information, received a copy of the ATF warrant from Christian Zyko, um, I sat my mother down and I talked to her and I told her, I said, I don't want you to say anything to any other family members yet. I said, because I need to try to see more about, you know, where this could go or, you know, if we can, you know, go forward and do anything. And so, of course, being a mother, it was, you know, she took, I mean, she listened to me, but the next day, <laughs> she went to the FBI. And, of course, they told her that, you know, that was not true. Uh, that my sister was never named in a warrant. Um, you know, they just more or less, you know, probably, mm -hmm. well, they wrote her off as a crazy black lady, you know. But yeah, she, but pr even before then, before I got a copy of that ATF warrant, yeah, she continued to um, check with the police. And um, there was one of my sister's friends, Tammy Dale. Tammy um, was one of, um, the kids in the neighborhood that my sister was like maybe in kindergarten through fourth or fifth grade with. She, Tammy wrote to, um, oh, there was a TV show on that, Search for People. And I have a copy <coughs> of that letter that Tammy brought to my mom that she sent to um, I, Unsolved Mysteries, I believe it was. So, I mean, there were some things that were done to try to, you know, but yeah, she continued to check with the police. I mean, but at that time, you got to look back to when that was. My sister um, would have been 53 years old this year. She was 14 when she came up missing. Nobody cared about a black child in the community uh, missing. Uh, they told my mom when she first tried to report her missing that she was a runaway. Mm -hmm. Well, why, I mean, why does she have to be a runaway? Mm -hmm. You know, so you just kind of walked away and you had to accept what somebody else told you when you had no power to make them do do otherwise. Mm -hmm. Yes? I, I hate to um, assume things. So I need to ask you, did you, have you formally requested all the information from the feds? No. But you have not. No. If, if I were to recommend something, I would sure recommend you that. Well, yeah, I, plan to do some things that I've, that I've not done that I've never done. Okay. Great. And then 
there are people who will help you through. Well, I appreciate that. <laughs> Any other questions? Um, yes. Did you get a chance to uh, question the, the people that's on the warrant as far as the officers who are supposed to execute? No, I didn't talk to anybody. Like I said, first of all, um, when that warrant, when a copy of that warrant was given to me by Christian Michael, I looked at that, and I'm here to tell you, um, it scared me to death. Well, it scared me to death to, to I mean, I, you know that anything is possible, but it scared me to see that, that people, the police, and people were actually involved in something or knew something about what happened to or what could have happened to my sister. And, and like I said, it, it, the fear of the un unknown scared me to death. You know, I start thinking, you know, well, here's my sister that's been missing all these years. Now we can go from believing that maybe it was a homicide to knowing that the police knew something. What or what they didn't know, I don't know, but they knew something because she's named in this warrant. And at that time, like I said, I had small children. I had children children uh, seven, eight, nine years old, you know, and um, I was a single parent. Nobody that I could really rely on to raise these children if something happened to me but my mother, who was aged. And it frightened me to think that if I went trying to poke around to see what I could find out, seeing that, you know, such high people, you know what I mean, in law enforcement were involved, it, it frightened me. It scared me. We're going to hold the questions until after, till the, after the Senate change. Get back to During those years, just as it is now, but even to a greater extent then, black people counted for nothing. Nobody had to acknowledge us as human beings. Nobody had to answer our questions. Whether it was a child or an adult who disappeared, it made them, when I say them, I meant the officials, the authorities, you should be able to approach. It made them no difference totally unresponsive. As you heard, no police report taken, none given. However, I believe, as suggested by Brother Parks, there is information somewhere, and it behooves us to try to find a way to get as much information on what happened during those days as we can. If it does nothing other than bring some degree I don't like the word of closure to a family after all these years, then it's worth that. When you look at Mondo and Ed Poindexter still in prison after 40 years, they went into prison when I went into the legislature. If I did not believe they were innocent, I would not have said so then, I would not say it now, and I would have contempt for both of them had they put a 14-year-old boy into a position to do the work, if it's to be done, that grown men ought to do. But Ed and Mondo, who was then known as David Rice, had nothing to do with what happened to Menard in 1970. I was running for the legislature. People who were my friends, and were looking out for my welfare as they saw it, told me that I should not be on television talking to the newspapers about my belief, my conviction, that Ed and Mondo were innocent because I wouldn't get elected. And I said, I want people to know what it is they're electing if they vote for me. If I conceal what I believe now, if I will not say it now because I'm afraid of the outcome or the fallout, why should you want me to be there representing you? Because if I was afraid to speak then, I would be afraid to speak there. And I said, rather than telling me, don't say anything, you ought to be happy that here's a politician who is willing to make it clear where he stands on an issue such as this. Then they understood, and they weren't trying to be insulting. They just thought they were telling me what was best, because to some people, the most important thing was for me to get elected. Mm -hmm. The most important thing for me has always been to let people know exactly what I am, where I stand, 
and that I will stand alone if necessary and say it if nobody listens until I'm satisfied inside that it need not be said anymore. If we had more people and there were some in positions who could at least make noise, ministers, they had a captive audience every Sunday and on other days of the week, silent. The NAACP did not take the position it ought to take. But what we have to keep in mind, and what I have to keep in mind, first of all, I've never been fearful. I've never been afraid to stand alone, and I did it then, and I do it now. I don't need a lot of company. I don't need anybody. Because nobody sees the world as I see it. And what I do is based on the way I understand it. So during those years, I would speak and sometimes I'd be the only voice. People would come to me to say something for them because they were afraid. And here's what we have to keep in mind, especially something like somebody like me. People can have a legitimate basis for being fearful. Here was a single parent, and I would have advised her, don't step out there alone and maybe be taken from your children when your primary responsibility right now is for those children who still have a mother to take care of them. If something happens to you, your sister may not be claimed and you'll be gone. And now we have a double tragedy, a missing child, and three children with a missing mother. There are people with jobs. They have got to make a living. They are not free to speak as strongly as some others who even though they have, I got fired from the post office because I, my way of looking at life is different. And my goal in life has been different. And it still is now. But what I have to keep in mind is that people are trying to make it through this world. People did not come into this world, in my opinion, to spend every waking hour of every day fighting against an unjust system that is going to be unresponsive, hateful, and vindictive. But there are some people whose lot it is to be like that. The FBI started coming after me when I was 24 years old, as best as I can determine. I left some articles back there because when I say things, people don't believe it. If they see it in the paper, written by white people, then they accept it. <laughs> I have told people that J. Edgar Hoover, because I got information through the Freedom of Information Act, I have the documents where it said the director instructed the agents not to confront the <coughs> chambers. They call me the target and other terms like that. You know how they use that language. Because he will embarrass the Bureau. J. Edgar Hoover himself on more than one occasion. And I've got the document. I don't even know why they gave me that. And people said, no, J. Edgar Hoover's not worried about you. I said, well, maybe you don't think he has a reason. But he obviously has one. And you know what I tell people? J. Edgar Hoover had President John F. Kennedy shaking in his boots. But see, John F. Kennedy was conducting a sexual relationship with Judith Exner, who was also the mob of Sam Giancana, a member of the mob. So he had to be quiet. He had Bob Kennedy, the Attorney General of the United States, shaking in his boots. He ordered Martin Luther King to come and talk to him and back off some issues. And these are things documented. You know the man who even the FBI had respect for other than me, Malcolm X? They said, this man is what he is all the time. <laughs> they tried to wire hotel rooms to catch him doing things that some of these preachers who were one thing in the pulpit and everything everywhere else and something else over there. That wasn't Malcolm. No women came to his hotel room. And that's why they feared Malcolm so much. Because Malcolm, when I say pure, I don't mean he was flawless beyond a human being, but as in terms of how you judge a man, he was 
what he appeared to be, and that's why there was so much respect for him in the community and so much fear of him among law enforcement. They were always able to intimidate people. In those years, there were young black men in Omaha as other places who wanted to imitate what they saw going on in other places, and they were drawn to me. And I told them, I would not send my children if they were old enough, because they were young then. Remember, I was a young person at one time. <laughs> I'm not going to send anybody else's children there. And I said, when you look at Martin Luther King, his wife is not out there. His children are not out there. So we should not put our wives and children out there. We as men should be out there. And he should not have allowed any women and any children in these demonstrations where they could be heard when his wife and his children were safe at home. I'm not saying they shouldn't have been safe at home. That's where a wife, that's where children should be. But don't let other wives and children come out there. I didn't want children in our demonstrations. Dan Goodwin and I and some others were asked by those people called the 4CL, the Citizens Coordinating Committee for Civil, Liberties. for what? Liberties? Yeah, no, oh yeah, Civil Liberties or something like that. <laughs> they would ask us to come along because they billed it as a nonviolent demonstration, but they knew that we would not allow anybody to hit us or anybody else without striking back. And they would ask us to come and we would go. All of that shamming pretending to be something, and putting other people's children out there. And I would tell even grown people, I know what I believe, and I know what I'm willing to risk. But if you don't feel the same way, don't get into something because you think I can get you out of it. I'm not going to put you in anything because I cannot promise to get you out of it. I was arrested several times. Charges wound up being dismissed. But the way the police did people and do people now is to put you through the inconvenience of being transported to the police station, charged, and they hope they can make you pay for a lawyer. And if the charges are dismissed immediately, they have done what they wanted to do, which is to show you that they're the boss. So during those years, they were like an occupying force in our community. They openly and notoriously insulted women treated women as though they were prostitutes. They would threaten and frighten little children. I lived in the projects. I lived among poor people because I was poor. And I don't pretend to be something I'm not. And I won't conceal what I was because that's what I was, a poor man. And you can say it away was by choice because I could have gotten a job, but I wouldn't take the job to make the money doing what I'd have to do to hold the job. So in a way, I was poor by choice. But one day, my wife called me. The barber shop was a couple of doors from Spencer Street on 24th. I lived in the Spencer Street project. She said, the police were up there bothering these little children. I said, what? She said, yeah, they're frightening these little children. So I went up there. And when they saw me coming, they took off in a cruiser. All these little children, afraid, white cops, doing that to our children. Then there are Negroes here who are going to tell me I shouldn't be upset and I shouldn't talk like I talk. They didn't see what I saw. They did not participate the way I participated. And I did put myself out there at risk in a way I would tell other people don't do because it's foolish. You don't see the need to do it. Don't do it because somebody else is doing it. I was convinced that's what I had to do. So when I came, the cruisers took off. <coughs> but in the little children's mind, I was stronger than the police. Because nobody in the project said anything. But as soon as they saw me coming, they took off. And here's how furious I was. I was chasing a police car. I was running down the street behind a police car. <laughs> And what could I have done, like they said, dog chasing a car, what could I have done if I caught it? But that was the way I reacted to things. I was often called to the police station when somebody's child was beaten up. 
3 o'clock in the morning. I would go down there. And my wife would say, Ernie, one of these times, somebody's going to set you up and something will happen to you. And I said, well, I don't think so, but I just have to go. And I'd go down to the police station. I'd be there when lawyers were not there, when preachers were not there. And you know why I say it? Because I'm telling the truth. And anybody who doesn't believe it can check the record, but they don't want to check the record because they know it's true. Then they cannot pretend that they don't know. I got charges dismissed against people even in those years. That was before I finished law school. I was a youngster by comparison. And these cops were vicious. They would come into people's houses, no warrant, come in because they want to, kick people's door down, literally. And I would file complaints, always filing complaints with the police, with the FBI, with the Justice Department. And people ask me, why do you do it? It's not going to do any good. I said, I want there to be a record of these things that are being done, and maybe every complaint I file will be burned up, torn up, or thrown away. But I will do everything that's available for me to do. And if you read those papers that I left back there about how the FBI tracked me all those years and couldn't find anything wrong, they hated me, they feared me, but they couldn't say he's out here chasing women or men, selling dope, getting drunk. Things they can say about the preachers couldn't be said about me. And you know the worst thing some people can say about me now? He doesn't go to church. Well, what do those people who go to church do? Who can our women even today turn to and I know this is not like a historical overview, but it's to try to show that we have problems today. If we spend time looking backward just for the sake of looking backward, we'll be backward. But if we study history to see what happened, that might explain why we're where we are now and how we got here. It will give us a way to lay out a road map so we won't re reproduce what has happened. What has re really troubled me when that serial sexual assaulter at Nathan Hale School was even publicized for having assaulted young black girls. I was the only one who speak out publicly. No ministers, no organizations, no teachers, no sororities, and these are our girls. And it's why I have no use for organizations of any kind. When something like that can happen, and two of the girls who brought complaints about this man to the principal was put out of school and called liars, other than me, silence. Freddie Gray on the school board, Shirley Tyree on the school board, black women. And I'm sure there are organizations they probably talked to about how women ought to do this and our girls ought to do that. And they were silent. And not only that, they joined the others on the board, minus Justin Wayne, in voting to support the way this thing had been mishandled by employees of the school board, of OPS. Nobody's, what are we afraid of? Now, if we're afraid now, can you understand why people during those very horrible days were afraid? Nobody's going to do anything to you. And you cannot speak up for our little girls. If that cannot be done, I have no use for organizations. I have no need to waste my time with them. I'm 74 years old. I want to stay here. For 100 years, which is not a long time, but not just to be here, to have more time to try to do some of the things that need doing that are not even being addressed. But when these white people who are in charge can see how frightened and intimidated our community is, and when I say our community now, I mean white people also. White people should have been outraged. See the difference between me and a lot of people, those could have been little white girls, and I would have done the same thing. I don't think anybody's child ought to be subjected to that kind of environment, 
and nobody say anything, nobody do anything. I'm a rhymester, not a poet. But if I were a poet, I'd write a poem entitled, Who Will Speak for Our Little Girls? Our little girls who are alone, who face the world alone, who are not believed, who are not respected, who are not protected. And then we go out and we beat our chest and we talk about, I'm for this, I'm for that, and I'm standing up for it. But somebody like me is looking with a different set of eyes. And y'all can criticize me any kind of way you want to. You can scandalize my name any kind of way you please. But I'm going to select the issues that I think are important and I'm going to address those issues. Now that I've gotten that out of my cross, so to speak, I do want to acknowledge the work being done by some organizations, some individuals, during all these years to try to help these two innocent men, Mondo and Ed Poindexter, get out of that penitentiary. They should not have been there. A lot of people don't know there was a black guy on that jury. He could have hung that jury, but he was the Tom. And I attended the trial. When some people from the BBC came here, my reputation is better everywhere else than it is in <laughs> And these men had heard about me in London, and they wanted me to accompany them to Spokane, Washington, because Dwayne Peake had been located. And before Ben got into the city council and joined the other side, he flipped. <laughs> he was there also. And my presence was what, gave, was what gave the whole thing credibility. And I went. And I talked to Dwayne Peake. And he was married to a white woman. He had little children. And it was around the holidays. So I gave him some money to get his children, because he probably celebrated Christmas, and if he did little kids, they don't know. So I said, get, get something for your children. And I said, Dwayne, I want to talk to you. You know what I want to talk to you about. <clears throat> so he said he would talk to me, and he came to my hotel room, and we talked. But he never would admit to having lied. And I said, Dwayne, right now, I have what you could call a light voice. Your voice is higher than mine. I said, that was not your voice on that call. You know it, and I know it. That voice, I told him, was deeper than the voice of James Earl Jones. <laughs> and here you've got a voice lighter than Pee Wee Herman's, and you're going to try to make people believe that you could reach a register that low at 14 years old. And then he just looked down. And I told him, I, at that time, these, the reporters, the people with the camera, they were not in the room. Because I thought that I could get him to talk. And one thing he told me, you all have to take my word for it. You are not there. I could be lying through my teeth, but I'm not. Because I don't need to lie. And there's nobody I fear enough to lie. And what one guy said about the Christians, you're brave toward God, but a coward toward men. Because you lie because you fear men, but you don't fear lying in the face and teeth of God. Dwayne told me that the police had put pressure on him. And when he was, in, he was upstairs at the police station, he was so glad to hear them talking about me being down in the lobby because he thinks that what protected him from a horrendous beating. Now, if any of you ever see Dwayne Peake asking, did he tell me that? I wasn't afraid to go to the police station or anywhere else. I wasn't afraid of the FBI, and I'm not <coughs> now. And I guess that's why they were tracking me and not tracking some of these other people. But after that conversation, Ben, or the reporters, the people from BBC, got a phone call. It was left at the desk. And the message was, don't try to talk to my client again. 
or there will be legal action undertaken. I said, did whoever make that call, did the lawyer leave a number? Because I want to talk to him. So he didn't leave a number. Because I would have told him, I welcome your legal action. Because in order for you to do that, you're going to have to reveal Dwayne Peak. And Dwayne Peak is going to have to testify as to what was discussed between him and me. And once he's on the stand, that opens the whole thing up. But see, the lawyer was not a fool, so he did not deal with me. Dwayne did not set that suitcase. Ed and Mondo had nothing to do with building the bomb. Ed did not know anything about explosives, contrary to what people say. He would not have known how to build the triggering mechanism that was in that suitcase. Mondo certainly didn't know. I always say a loaded brain is more powerful than a loaded gun. <laughs> when it came to Mondo and Ed, the police feared a loaded mouth more than they did a loaded gun because there were people out here shooting and doing things that they didn't feel the need to frame up to get into the penitentiary. But because Ed and Mondo were talking and writing, they were a greater threat. The enemy knows the power of words. The enemy knows the power of what you might call propaganda if you're on the other side, but of well-reasoned arguments. Those who can make people aware of what they're confronting and point it out in a way that they themselves, although they're experiencing it, may not be conscious of what's happening and persuade them that they're worthy of something better than this. That is when a community or a segment of the community begins to grumble and then complain and then express outrage and then take it to the next level and say, talking is not going to work. We have to do something. You see where the FBI was going after me because they said he's becoming more militant in what he says. Not anything I did. They had tapes of talks that I gave that I don't even have tapes of. When I was giving talks to farm groups around the country, they were going, and you know why I was giving them? Because a white farmer got killed by the state patrol in Nebraska, and I won't go into all the details it takes too long, but to show you it's not just us. And sometimes racial lines have to be breached. And I helped his family. And there were white people with the state patrol and in the legislature who told me this man was a racist. And they found racist literature in his house. I said, well, the state patrol didn't kill him because he's a racist. Because if they killed him because he's a racist, some of y'all would be dead. <laughs> That's not why they killed this man. And even if he was a racist, that will not stop me from trying to help his family. Because they were still being hungry and harassed. No white people were coming to their aid, by the way. No legislators. Nobody from law enforcement. No ministers. Because they were considered to be on that dangerous fringe that white people were afraid of. But what I did to help them, they must have a network that went all over the country. And I was getting invi invitations to speak, and I spoke. <laughs> and one group that I went to in Iowa, I said, look, here's what happens sometimes. People get so upset that they do things and hurt their family. I said, I've read where farmers have killed members of their family then committed suicide. I said, if any of you all think like that, commit suicide first and then get your family. Your family is not the one. They don't need to die. And at none of the talks that I gave did violence result thereafter. Because I didn't go there to inflame people. When people are inflamed and that's all, they cannot even approach their issue. When I would leave, they would talk about how nobody in government had ever thought enough of them to even listen to them. But I listened and I gave them my thoughts. I do that now. And that's what we need. You all don't have to do anything the way I do it. You don't have to say anything the way that I say it. But I think the dedication that has been shown by some people is commendable. It shows that you're going to be there in fair weather, and foul. If there is a lot 
of publicity and a lot of upswing because every now and then there might be some to help model ahead, then there are people who will be drawn to that. But there are others who like the termites, not seen, but they're steadily doing their work. They don't make a lot of noise. But one of these days, one of these days, somebody in that edifice is going to step out of bed in the penthouse and wind up in the basement <coughs> because the termites have, in their own way, eaten everything away. I don't know if they'll ever get out of prison. We don't know a lot of things. But as long as there's anything we can do that might help them, that's what we have to continue to do. Mondo's mind is so strong. His spirit is so undaunted that in that penitentiary, he's one of the most highly respected people among inmates and the staff alike. They know how debilitating, how deteriorating it is to be locked up that long for something you didn't do. And there are people in the prison system who don't believe Mondo and Ed are guilty. But rather than vegetate, Mondo has helped other inmates He's remained upbeat. There are people who go into the penitentiary downhearted, and they've gotten a lift from this man who's serving a life sentence for something he didn't do. So if he can be strong during all of this, you all can continue. And there are people who are aware of what you're doing, but it's obvious you're not doing it just because people are going to praise you, just because people are going to say, that's a wonderful thing. You have a conviction, I'm convinced anyway, that you're operating based on conviction. So let's say there are 100 issues, and we disagree on 99 of them. Violently, that wouldn't blind me so much that I cannot recognize the value of what you're doing on the one that we agree on. And this is one we agree on. I think I've probably taken too long. I might have gone in a direction other than what was anticipated. But when I heard Vicki talk, there's so many things that went through my mind. The murder of Vivian Strong and their family came to me. I was involved in that. A young man named Eugene Nesbitt was shot. I'm not going to list all the people who were shot. But every time a black person then reached the point, because some white people got shot by the police, the families would seek me out. I've got boxes of the way I wrote out all of these reports. Because at that time, there was a county attorney, he didn't like me, but he didn't care if I had the police report, so he'd give them to me, and I'd go through each one, and I'd point out all the contradictions, and I'd file complaints with the Justice Department. And maybe none of them exist, but I kept records, and I kept copies of all of these things. And when you go back through that, and you see the circumstances under which young black people are killed, it doesn't take any stretch of the imagination to know why a single mother does not want to come up against these people. They took her sister, as she said, what would stop them from doing something to any child? The police didn't take that disappearance seriously. Why should you go to the ones who have shown they don't care and expect them to do something about something they have had a part in creating? I have to be careful in being too hard on people <coughs> who were trying to survive during those days. But remember this, I wasn't in a pulpit saying do this and that. I wasn't speaking from a classroom, although I was in school. I was out there in the street too. I was getting threats. The window in the barber shop was shot out, chairs shot up, double off buckshot. Threats made against me that the FBI even brought to me. And I asked, in one case, why are you even telling me? They said, well, if something happens, if we want to be able to put in our report that we can you. I had an article. It may have been, I don't even remember who was president then, because things run together in my mind. They arrested this guy because he made a, a threat against the president and Ernie Chambers. So I said, but I bet you arrested him because he made the threat against the president, and you really went upside his head if you did, because he made it clear that he was threatening me. Now, if he'd gone ahead and done something to me, you'd have forgiven him for threatening the president. So if you want to talk about somebody who's being threatened, I'm threatened all the time, even now. In my office, they would tack threats on the door. They slide them under the door. They curse me out on the telephone, and the woman in my office, and I said, don't listen to those calls. I'm the one in the office, not you. 
they'd write letters and tell me they're coming to get me, and I didn't know whether it was valid, the return address, but I'd write a letter to the return address and say, you know where to find me. I'm down here every day, and I say it on the floor of the legislature. I say it on my program because the word comes back to me that people are looking for me. How many of you think it would be hard to find me? How many of you know me to run from anybody or anything? And I'm not Superman, and I know that. But it's not in me to run. A threat was made against me by a guy who sent it in the mail. I thought it was funny. He had computer-generated hands holding two pistols. So I showed it to some people in the legislature, and they were alarmed. See, white people don't hit threats like that. They can watch it happening to other people, and it ain't no big thing, but somebody can say boo to them, and they want to run. So they took that very seriously, and they gave it to the head of the state patrol. And he came over, and he said, he said, Senator, we need to take steps to, I said, to do what? He said, well, to provide security. I said, let me tell you this, Colonel. Abraham Lincoln was a president. He was assassinated. Other presidents were assassinated. I think Garfield. They shot at Ford. And, well, the woman didn't get off and shot, I think. Somebody shot at Teddy Roosevelt and missed him. I said, they shot Reagan. If somebody wants to do something to somebody, they can do it. So don't waste your time saying you're going to offer me security because I don't want it. They had what they call a panic button. They put it on the whole desk of the center. But they didn't even ask me because they knew I would have told them, get out of my office. I don't want that. Because when I came to the legislature, they drilled holes in the ceiling and put closed circuit television cameras to watch me. And I told them, I didn't come down here to fight. I came down here as a legislator. You shouldn't have damaged the ceiling, but that's what they did. It's documented. I'm not making it up. That's the kind of environment I functioned in. And other people cannot function there even without the threats. So you know what I did when I got that threat? And the FBI was called in because the state patrol was involved. And the colonel came and he said, he said, Senator, I have to tell you that there was a clear fingerprint that was gotten from a piece of scotch tape that was used. <laughs> I said, uh, well, what am I supposed to do about that? He said, the FBI didn't want us to let you know that they got anything. Mm -hmm. And you know why? To show that if I found out whose fingerprint it was, I would probably want to do something. Now, we have so many situations where the FBI lied, where the FBI concealed information, <coughs> that we don't trust them and shouldn't. So what I did, I got a sweatshirt, and I still have it. And I they used to have some stuff you can squeeze it out of a tube. And then when it hardens, it's like rubberized plastic. And I drew a target <laughs> on my shirt. And I put the date in Norfolk, Nebraska, because that was a postmark. I called the radio station. I told them about the threat. And they may have even been some articles about it, so they were aware of it. I said, I'm going to come to your town and I'm going to do some speaking. Do you have a park? And he said, oh, what? I said, do you, is there a park in your town where people go? And he told me, yeah, they, they told me where it was. I said, well, if you're interested and people listen to your radio station, let them know that I'm coming to Norfolk and I'm gonna speak at that park. He said, will you speak on my radio station? I said, yes, I will. And if you got a newspaper, I'll give them an interview. <coughs> And he said, well, why would you do that? I said, people who make those anonymous threats are cowards. But on the chance that this person who wants the opportunity, I'm going to give it to him. So I went up there alone, not running. There are a lot of people who won't even go to these little towns. I went to one of these little crazy towns, and alone, I looked up, and there's Tarek. Oh, he's Tarek brought two or three people with him, so I wouldn't be alone. And I wouldn't tell people that. I said, you, all you can do is get in my way. I might can't protect myself, and i got to worry about it. But there, he, he came. But at any rate, I talked in the park, and some of the people in the park were nervous. I talked on the radio, and they thought that was the most heroic thing in the world. And that it took courage. I said, it didn't take an ounce of courage. Let me tell you what courage is. But before I tell you that, let me tell you, bravery 
It's when you're willing to do something, even though there's danger and you're not afraid. I say to be daring means that you do even what the brave won't do because you're not afraid. And the foolhardy will do what even the daring won't do because there's no fear. I said the only one who has courage, in my view, is the one who's afraid, who is shaking in his boots and feels fear, but will do what has to be done anyway. In the absence of fear, there cannot be courage. Nothing that I do takes any courage because I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid to talk to the governor. I ran Jimmy Carter out of the White House and I have articles to prove it because I asked some questions he didn't expect to be asked and he cut short his presentation and left. We were there to talk about SALT to strategic arms limitation treaty but I wanted to ask why they fired Andrew Young for talking to the PLO when one of the Jewish people in his cabinet talked to a member of the PLO and they didn't fire him. Why he intimidated his generals to the extent where they wouldn't speak against SALT too, And that America was the most racist country in the world. And the first thing he said, well, I, I, I didn't fire Andrew. He, no, he's the president. I'm a senator from Nebraska. I had on my sweatshirt, and he called on me the man in the blue sweatshirt. I think they thought I was a curio and a novelty, so he's going to have some fun. And when you're underestimated, and when your enemy puts you under the lap, then he gives you the advantage if you come with something. But if you come with nothing, then you're just a clown and a buffoon. He said, so I, didn't, I just looked at him impassively, didn't change my expression, and it rattled him. And he said, well, if, 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 you, don't, if you don't think I'm telling the truth, ask him yourself. I didn't know Andrew Young. Now the president is going to have that kind of exchange with me, and it was written about in the paper. Then he said, my, my, my generals are not afraid to speak, and I just looked at him. And he said, and besides that, I don't think America's a racist country, and all the racists in the room, it was the room, whatever room in the White House, they all gave him thunderous applause. And then just like this corridor where he cut out and was not seen or heard from again that day, and there was supposed to be a reception. He didn't go to it. I spoke before the UN, dressed in a sweatshirt, and my presentation was the one that the New York Times wrote about. We were talking about divesting money from South Africa, because they had never seen anybody like me, never heard anybody like me. And the delegates were even looking back, because they were all down in a big room, and we were at a table up there with microphones, and they had these little buttons in there, so what we said could be translated and interpreted. And they're all looking back to see who was saying this. I testified before Congress when they had what they called the Defense of Marriage Act or something. And I was against it because I was one of the first senators off a bill, and this is going to make a lot of y'all upset, maybe, to allow same-sex marriage in Nebraska. And you know the only thing I had to do? I didn't have to write a long treatise. All I had to do was eliminate the words that say marriage between a man and a woman. That's all that I had to do. They don't know anything about legislating. And they were scared to death that I was going to get it done. 